Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we are live and thank you for being part of the Horasis uh, conference today and our panel on the greatest transfer of private wealth focused on next gen family offices. I believe at the moment it is just the five of us on the panel, um, but hopefully more will join um, as we develop and, and more people uh, get into this. Uh, so my name is David Homan and I'm very grateful for my colleague, uh, Peter here, who's the most dapperly dressed one uh, in our uh, gorgeous panel of participants uh, for helping put this together and giving us uh, the floor to each share our perspectives. Uh, we have with us um, Sophia Sanaga, Matthew, Matthew Salenza, and Lynn Zavigian. And I apologize if I pronounced anyone's name correctly, incorrectly, but I have been in a situation where my last name has been pronounced wrong my entire life. So welcome to the club. Um, what we are focused on now is an understanding and an idea of the burdens and responsibilities that come from great wealth and the assumptions and the challenges that everyone needs to face, whether it's their family or a family they work with. Um, this panel, you know, the question was, you know, will the role that we have lead to positive social impact, financial stability, and greater wealth distribution? Or will this enormous control of private wealth of the 1% continue along the same trajectory? Now that, that's a loaded question to start this, but it's the assumption is that the massive accumulation of wealth doesn't relate to its distribution or its impact. And I think what we really need to understand from each of our perspectives and the thousands of other families that are in this situation is that we live in an ever-changing world where power structures are no, no longer focused on this idea of currency, but instead are focused on the current. They're focused on the ways that we have to ride the wave we have to change as the world changes. We have to adapt to the way that the Arab Spring could change the entire face of the Middle East and then see it change again and again. The way that the Me Too movement could galvanize and bring down icons, but at the same time not address the wealth disparity between men and women. Uh, living in a world where social justice uh, in the US focus um, ignores the plight of millions of people across the world that need the same focus um, and the idea that private wealth is responsible for this is a false one. The solution cannot happen without private wealth. And what I've seen from my role as the New York ambassador, ambassador of Nexus in particular is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, multi-generational families where the youth are leading the charge. They're looking at the world that they are going to inherit and say, I'm not going to inherit the situation later that my privilege and my position and my influence can tackle now. And I think this is one of the most profound changes that social media has positively brought into this world because we now have a world where everyone is connected and therefore we share all of our problems. But we also share all of our solutions. So with that, I'd like to turn to our panelists to just address a little bit of the type of impact that you or the family you work with want to have on the world and where you see at least one or two of the greatest needs to be addressed. Um, and Sophia, if it's okay, we'd love to start with you. Sure. Um, thank you everyone, such a pleasure to share the panel with um, people doing the good work. <laughs> And I'll begin with this, um, the passion, I think, is a generation passion of a millennial generation of collaboration. And my particular interest in uh, supporting and finding our collaborative advantage. What I see is that um, we are finding one another through conferences, interests, like there is a connectivity that has allowed um, a generation like never before to find one another. And now I feel the, a clustering of different interests, causes, passions. And, and then I feel we're at, at the phase where we must then find what is it that I as an individual bring to a group. So in engaging with each other, I refine my own purpose and find my, the unique contribution that I can bring to a group. So that, so that, that's the focus for me. And I am adding there the intergenerational component. So, how do we invite different generations to also collaborate? And then how each generation will understand and see the world completely differently. 
And at the same time, they have that unique contribution. So I would say, um, in a nutshell, collaborative advantage is an area of uh, focus for me. And I feel and just to open up the conversation, the greatest need I see of co-investment and collaboration because each problem we see is so much larger than any one of us could potentially do by ourselves. So what does co-investment look like? And not only of financial capital, but of multiple forms of capital, of social, of social trust, intellectual, um, spiritual, you know, um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Great. Well, thank you, Sophia. Uh, your perspective is the key one uh, because collaboration means discussion and it means listening. And if we lived in a world where people actually discussed things and listened, we wouldn't have the problems we have to this extent. Um, and that, that comes on many levels, but it brings it back to a personal level, which is the most important part of moving impact together as a society, because it's unique to each of us. Um, so Lynn, um, would love to hear your perspective as well. I mean, your family does an incredible amount of work, often unrecognized because you're the pioneer in the space. But where do you see this greatest need and the type of impact that you have within it? Thank you so much, David, and very happy to be here with all of us this evening. Um, so hello from Beirut, uh, which is where I am this evening. The question is actually a really tough one. And I think one of the problems with the question is that um, we, we have many great needs that we need to be addressing. And I think it's a huge problem that in this 21st century, in this incredible year of a great pandemic and, and all the many things that have gone wrong um, in Lebanon and in the other parts of, of, of the Middle East, it's incredible that there are so many great needs that need to be addressed. If there was one that I had to bring, um, or let's say I had to bring voice to, I would say it is the need to bring data to diplomacy so that peace can have a very, very loud voice. And I see the role of wealth and capital. And thank you so much, Sophia, for being so, so multidimensional in the necessary definition of what capital needs to be like. Um, it is about intellectual and spiritual and diplomatic capital, um, not just financial. All those forms of capital need to, we need to get really good at intersectionalities between them so that peace can be as loud and even louder than often what wealth and, 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 and business capital um, gets in terms of elevated voice on stage and on global international, um, you know, diplomatic convenings. So yes, diplomacy charged by data to fuel voice, loud voice for peace. Okay, well, thank you, Lynn, for bringing a voice to that and couldn't agree more with the idea that we can't have collaboration and discussion without understanding the facts. And when we can understand the facts, we can move from a place that can have a real understanding of what purpose to move things towards. Because when things are based entirely on sentiment and often very false and emotional sentiment, we live in a world of impasse because we people won't admit they're wrong, but they might admit another perspective could be right if you come from any sort of factual basis. Uh, so Matthew, with, with your work, you know, representing a multitude of families, uh, what do you see as uh, the best way to, to amplify impact uh, within the work you have, you have with very deep long-term relationships across the spectrum. Well, uh, thank you for having me today. It's uh, very exciting to be a part of uh, anything like this because uh, after hearing Lynn and Sophia uh, speak, uh, foundationally we're, we're in such agreement, right? Even if we're coming at it from different perspectives, we all believe that our position in this professional world uh, can be incredibly impactful in and of itself. And uh, when I worked for the major banks for you know a better part of my career, uh, being unique and forward thinking wasn't always accepted as common practice. So uh, now that I'm an independent advisor, 
I feel like I've been unleashed and I have a bigger purpose than just making people, you know, additional money. And, you know, impact was always a big um, commonality amongst my clients. I do have uh, uh, several families that I uh, act as head of family office, um, but there is a luxury that we're afforded, and that's the, 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 the core belief. And I truly believe that as an advisor, as a professional, you have to work with people, uh, maybe not financially uh, equal, but definitely mindful of one another. So we kind of think the same. And what we're really seeing is how do you take these, um, this wealth that you've amassed, either in the first generation, which we're typically managing, or the eventual transition of wealth, and make the biggest impact. And so we focus a lot less on the investment side of the world. That's almost a, a pretty common uh, and easy process. And we concentrate more on how do we put these dollars to, to use. And what we have found is that within this process, we've eliminated most of our competition because most people just want to go out and make more money. And we're talking more about impacting communities on a local level. And it's something that you can touch and feel. And our clients have really kind of gravitated towards that uh, idea, not just having their name on a building, but actually going into some of these incredibly hard hit communities in the Los Angeles area. Um, we're not in the Middle East and we're not in other, you know, uh, well-known hard hit areas in the world. But I can tell you we have as much of a humanitarian crisis, you know, six miles from my office uh, than anyone does anywhere. And we found it to be an incredible process for education to the next generation, for involvement and definitely for impact. So um, I think that one of our basic core philosophies is that we will help make your money matter in more ways than just a net worth value. And that has really changed the mindset of a client. And it's less about where the stock market is or where interest rates are. And it's more about what can we use this power for? And that's an incredible, incredible position. And it kind of takes a job that's otherwise mundane and stressful and turned it into a very exciting position in life. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to represent that philosophy. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that and your perspective on making a focus on impact be the driving force. Uh, that's something that I think a lot of families, once they understand, is as important as philanthropists to see where they give, to see where their impact can really resonate, uh, is a key part of addressing these issues now as opposed to when um, both the issues and the wealth are inherited. Uh, so, Peter, you know, your perspective you know, as somebody who's lived on five continents, I always wonder which one you didn't live on. Um, but I would love to get, you know, you have a, a myriad of focuses um, as, as a philanthropist, as a human, humanitarian, everything that you do. Uh, what would you say uh, do you think is the most pressing issue that needs amplification uh, in this world of impact and next gen focus? There are many ways I could describe it because it's like looking into a diamond and there's many, many facets and dimensions within the diamond. But if you distill it and distill it and distill it further, imagine if every single person had at least the opportunity to understand the, the, the power and, the, um, and, and, and have the self-esteem to be all they could be. A lot of us that are on this, this panel, somewhere along the line, maybe we had uh, amazing uh, parents that gave us a certain core values, a sense of confidence, love, uh, obviously a, a, a lifestyle where we could be cultivated to become a, the best version of us and cultivate what we all have inside of us is a unique and special superpower. We all have it. So at that, at the, at the, 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 the most distilled level, as we are essentially sort of spiritual beings in a, in, in a physical body, most people are uh, so caught up in, in just the survival mode. There's, there's billions and billions of people on our earth that uh, are just li literally managing uh, a, a, a meager subsistence. And it's the psychological aspects and obviously other aspects around that, particularly from the ages of zero to seven, zero to eight, that really shapes your personality, you know, your power of your subconscious mind. And I didn't realize it when I was younger, but now I remember, I, I, I feel I was very, very blessed to have those values self-esteem and other tools instilled into me. My parents did not give me any um, uh, of, of the tools to be a uh, global citizen, but they did give me the ability to believe in myself and then trust that inner voice. 
Now, as far as, and that's going to the distilled version, but as far as what my mission is, and I believe I could do it, Lynn could do it, Sophia could do it, Matt could do it, you could do it. We could all in one way or another positively socially impact in excess of a billion lives. And with, again, we've all had that superpower that we've accumulated. I've really been focusing a lot more recently on this, um, a, a lot of A-list celebrities, business leaders and institutions from around the world. I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding about family offices. For those that do understand the sector, there is a thought that next gens necessarily don't have any worries, uh, that they're not necessarily self-made. They don't necessarily have goals, but, but when you actually notice it, they are the driving force behind this whole social impact and social change movement, in my opinion. They are interested in social impact. They are interested in technology. And I think the growth trajectory of social impact with the institutions, uh, I think some of it is, is relied on the, on the back of it. So part of with these, these celebrity uh, business leader and other sort of projects, really what they're trying to galvanize at the end of the day, David, is the large institutions to obviously uh, recognize and grow the alternative uh, investment category of social impact further. Um, once that's done and those institutional funds are being unlocked uh, in a proper way where there's a proper criteria, there's proper uh, measurement, it's, it, it, it's being allocated. If people are given the choice of an investment that will be profitable uh, and one that, uh, one that uh, will be profitable with a social impact, I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd be choosing uh, the social impact one. And I think the criteria from the, the, the institutional level, the, the government leaders, et cetera. And that's that's why I'm, I'm really at harassus, because I believe that's the ultimate next move uh, that we, we, we can all play a hand in. And that burden doesn't necessarily have to remain on the backs of family offices uh, that are putting that much needed one million, five million, ten million in to start things. Then some things need hundreds of millions or billions. So I actually take my hat off to some of these unsung heroes that are family offices and next gens uh, that are doing this sort of, uh, as you could say, God's work in secret. Uh, but the, the perception of them is often much, much different to the, the actual reality. I, I really appreciate that perspective, Peter. Um, a, a wise friend of mine corrected me that any time I ever run a panel ever in the future, I should never say we should really see what it's like to walk in another man's shoes. I think the way we approach this now is we see what it's like to walk in a woman's shoes, in a minority's shoes, in a, in a kid's shoes. Because when we look at what the impact is, we are looking to change the status quo of a billion of billions and to give them empowerment, to give them voice. And that comes in a lot of ways, but without giving people who have the means the understanding of the options we have, without giving people the data, as you mentioned, Lynn, to understand where their voice can be heard and diplomacy and power can be put into the hands of those with the right choices to make for others, as opposed to their self-interest. And Matt, without your perspective, along with Sophia's, of understanding where you can find your motivation in impact, you can find your purpose in it, and you can do that in a way that only works when we collaborate we can get into a lot more uh, focused discussions around what we are doing as opposed to what we think the world needs to be or as opposed to thinking about the, what the world could be if only somebody else than us stepped forward to make that change. And so, you know, the hard thing is um, that families are families and it's very challenging to take a collaborative approach with people who also changed your diapers. Uh, to take a collaborative approach with people who built a business or maintained a business. And that intergenerational issue is one that I think has a couple assumptions with it. Um, the same way that it is shocking for people to learn that celebrities have mental health issues, that an A-list artist can be depressed, can feel alone. Um, I think that the world of wealth, the assumption is for everyone outside of it, that you have everything you need and not to understand the controls placed on so many of the next generation. And in many cases, what I found is that those controls are there out of a fear for what the person who puts the controls in thinks they would do. And as the world matures in terms of where we need impact now, a lot of, Peter, as you mentioned, the next generational charge, a lot of what uh, these individuals are doing is they're collaborating and they're sharing their best practices 
and they're really sharing their best practices for how to bring their family along to address that change now. So what I'd love to open up uh, for all of you to address in any particular order is, you know, just to give a sense of the type of lessons you've learned from these family dynamics and, and how you've been able to bring, you know, collaboration and positive change into more of a focus to have this impact. I, I could take a stab at that because that's that's something that we discuss quite often here uh, in the office when I'm here. Um, I've been very lucky to have had first generational wealth business opportunities, and it all started you know years ago when the internet uh, in Silicon Valley took off. And uh, you know I had a neighbor who uh, had no money; he'd come to eat at my house quite often. Uh, didn't have a car. Uh, but he was a pretty pretty smart guy, and ended up with a piece of paper in a company that put you know, several hundred million dollars uh, in his bank account instantly on one of these IPOs. And not knowing anything, he tasked me with the uh, idea of going out and figuring it out. And so in that process um, of kind of figuring out how to best uh, put together the right team for him and how to think about managing his money mainly, um, I missed a lot of opportunities that I was forced to learn uh, in the field. And one of them was the fact that he didn't have less problems once he made money. He had more problems. And those problems were deep seated. They weren't, he couldn't pay his bills. Um, they were much deeper problems. And I, I took that on as a personal issue and a personal responsibility to try to figure ways to uh, mitigate these issues. Because I knew that it would get in the way of any future um, plans that he had for marriage or children or legacy, what have you. And we have honed uh, certain ideas over the past, and it's really helped us with this idea that the the matriarch or the patriarch and whoever's making the money has to kind of keep the next generation out of it, and they're going to just have an inheritance. We don't use that word inheritance. Uh, we like to use legacy. We like to use family bank because we have figured ways to include people in the family unit um, in certain ways, and one of them is philanthropy. And when you have uh, an, an early teen, or sometimes depending on the maturity of the, of the, the sibling or the child, um, it could be even younger. And that is an incredible opportunity to introduce someone to not only the idea of finances, but also the impact of using these finances for a particular reason. And it's really helped us as a tool kind of bring a new process into place in terms of how you create a family dynamic that has some sort of a governance because um, I can't tell you how many times we've had clients come in here and say, let's do all this trust work and we don't want anyone to know until we die. And right. we start seeing problems occur immediately. And so I think that our process has been at least uh, not only accepted, but implemented with most, if not all of our families. And I think that they look at us a little bit differently because we always reiterate to clients that once you have a certain amount of money, um, making more becomes a bigger liability financially from an estate perspective. And obviously, we can do the math to show the risk-adjusted returns behind a billionaire making more money in terms of his estate issues. So what we try to focus them on is living a better life and leaving more to the causes and the people you want. And it kind of takes away that stress of the daily stock market grind or the political issues that are going on. But utilizing philanthropy from a very early stage tease up the next generation, no matter what their profile is, because one can be business minded and one can be artistic, but they can all have uh, certain causes that they want to get behind. And that's been our kind of breeding ground for education. And it's really worked well. And it's really, uh, I think we're looked at differently as advisors if we kind of go down that path. Hey, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll love to give out other perspectives because every family and every group is different. And obviously, yeah. Sophia, I know that your answer is going to be collaboration is the key. But have you found that collaboration in a family dynamic is as easy to achieve uh, when it's intergenerational? So <laughs> I think by, by definition, it will be more challenging in right how we are raised um, with different worldviews, particularly when technology accelerates so fast. Right now, like video games and talking to my my little brother who's nine years younger you know <laughs> there are speeds even of attention that i won't be able to follow so how do i keep closing that nine year difference considering 
you know, our silent generation and our boomers when time and speed was so different. And this COVID times are really trying times. Um, and I feel that many of them are feeling isolated. Like this is like entering in an unknown room. Like how do you switch the lights? How do you sit in the room? What is the protocol? Socially, we're all learning. And I think it, there is a special care that needs to be there to also onboard our elders, so to speak, so that we may learn from them, right? In these spaces too. Um, so I'll, I'll add a little bit to what um, Matt was saying and um, also maybe opening a little bit more about intergenerational collaboration. So in speaking, for example, of, of metrics and measurement, I think collaboration is made um, harder when one holds to one specific perspective that he or she sees as right, and then is trying to convince the others right of that. So Peter began with the diamond facet, how to hold my own perspective and another, even if it's paradoxical, can I hold that within myself? At the same time and I'll, I'll give the example here for example I'll hold the paradox of philanthropy and measurement I've, I have a deep kind of longing in my heart that there's still important to keep free gifting with no strings attached and no measurements whatsoever as part of practice of everyone's practice potentially of income investment gifting right to to bring free gifting because we we cannot measure that which we don't know and sometimes the hundred dollars to the tip or to the gas station might have larger implications and impact that we would never be able to measure ourselves right so in trying to make everything strategic i feel we might be using a six foot ruler to measure an entire football stadium Right. Looking at COVID, especially for using the metrics of the past, particularly legacy, I'm going to say inherited metrics. So I would like to pose a, a spectrum of when we measure, when we don't measure at all, and when we create new metrics. Because those are there are people who are seeking to find that new metric that was not was totally invisible, needs to be made visible. Right. But each of us will fit in that spectrum with our different capacities. And I feel that this is what this exercise that we just shared um, by providing a spectrum or a landscape where everyone can locate themselves in relationship to one another facilitates. Oh, I belong. <laughs> it's not that what I see is only the only thing or is wrong or is right. It's actually contextual. <laughs> And I see now how what I believe holds true to what you believe in, in relative right distance or proximity. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it's such a beautiful point. I mean, it even opened up my mind uh, in terms of how we look at the way that we think results need to be achieved. And if you're going to hold in your place uh, other family members and the fact they will all have a differing opinion, then if you can figure out a different way to measure or agree not to measure, I think that's really important. I mean, my three-year-old is in this situation where he would want to take a ruler and measure a football field, but he would do the same with a block and a domino or a fire truck. And then we lose that perspective because we think we have to conform to one idea of what a result is. And that's where these differences are. So, you know, Peter, you know, having uh, advised and worked and done a lot of this, um, in the climate world and, and the rest, what would you say are the most uh, inherent challenges uh, in the dynamics you see that need to be addressed in a positive way to move more impact forward? Sorry, I, I didn't hear all the question. Could you just sure, repeat that, David? Um, uh, in, in your perspective, uh, what do you see are the most pressing issues that need to be addressed across families um, in order to rectify the concerns and move things forward positively. Okay, because there's there's obviously the heart centered side, and then there's also the, the the practical application. And with families, it's a very sensitive situation where uh, because they are they are family members, it's not business, and uh, each and every person has his debt and in a unique uh, direction they may wish to go into, in, in, into the next part of the uh, part of their lives. So look, at its core, 
um, obviously governance needs to play a role. Uh, a family constitution needs to play a role, but it needs to be around universally agreed values of the family. What does the family stand for? Uh, who are we? What is our legacy? And since we've been blessed with such uh, wealth and opportunity that others haven't, how do we give back uh, to ensure that this through this whole flow of synchronicities uh, that we are, are contributing perspective? I think they don't even define it. And it, it, it's amazing from from uh, I, I come across this so often. Ask someone what they want. When's the last time someone on this, this stream has asked, what are you passionate about? What would you love to really do if you didn't have an issue with time, uh, money or other responsibilities? And it may be a, a different answer than what you would assume they would want. And I think assumption of what someone wants and what's in their heart is actually uh, part of the disharmony that, 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 uh, and rivalry that can occur with families. So I think governance and uh, succession is a key part. The other uh, area I would look at is, OK, you may agree to disagree on this or, or that issue. But how can we look at working together on, on one or a few objectives in a, from a point of collaboration, co-creation and another term, co-elevation? I think the first two are, are pretty self-explanatory. But how do we work together and elevate the people around us um, with these these rivalries that can occur within families? Often it's because they're all thinking about how, how they you know, impress, uh, for example, the patriarchal generation to be considered, you know, the the, the, the head of the um, head of the family. And, and when you go to developing markets, that's very, very true. It's actually a true honor to be trusted with the family business and with the tr family money. Uh, it's very different in some Western society uh, countries like uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, USA and, and certain parts of Europe. It's, it's, it's individualistic. Um, you want may want to go in your own direction. Um, that may, may differ from, from, from the actual patriarchal um, intention. So I think how you actually, on, on that one project, and that's how it starts small, uh, and that's how you know, my family got me involved in things, and then also when I partnered up with other families, we started small on something uh, local, obtainable, but we all were passionate about and believed in the vision. I can't hear you, David. David, you're muted. Sorry, it popped on. I would thank you. I was saying thank you, um, and that I will ask you another time what you'd like to do if you had no burdens in life. Hopefully, the answer won't be like binge watch Seinfeld and eat Rocky Road. But if that's what you want, then so be it. Um, <laughs> Lynn, I would love to hear uh, your closing perspective on this part uh, in terms of the way that you approach this with your family especially being uh, in a region that needs such focus and attention and collaboration to really solve some very uh, hard hitting issues and problems. Thank you so much, David. And I, I loved hearing what everybody had to say because it actually does remind us how global family is. And I know we've been talking a lot about the complexities of family um, together today. I'd like us to also bring us back to the simplicity of family. And that's really how um, I would say my parents have raised my brother and I. And, and when I was thinking about your question, David, I was thinking about our family dinner table. What are the simple rules that we have been raised with as a family and how vital those rules have have been in, in our adulthood and, and who we are as global citizens and as business leaders and peace builders today. M my parents raised my brother and I to be uh, in a very strict way, which meant that values were the red lines that were never taken for granted. But at the same time, my parents gave a lot of space. So, for example, at the family dinner table, which, by the way, was one of the very strict rules, you have to always be at the dinner table by 1930 and, you know, ready to either help set up the table altogether and then we, we take our seats. It was 
very intentional in my parents' part to create a dinner table that always appreciated the diversity of the voices that would be at that table. So the point of measurement wasn't that we all agreed. The point of measurement was that it was a safe and trusted space, believed in by all, and as a convening point that we could always all turn to. That was the point of measurement. And it's incredible because it still is the point of measurement. I would say that today, family dinner is, family dinner time is, is our ritual. And so I, I think I would also like to speak to one more um, important parallel to that, which is trust. And I think that has been the most, the biggest underlying principle that has governed um, my, my parents and my brothers' sort of ways of working together because we do have family business interests together as well. And that is to say that my father, especially, really um, has, has um, built himself with a specific leadership philosophy. The difference between the good leader and the great leader is the good leader knows how to lead, and the great leader knows when it is time to no longer lead. And on that basis, from a very, very early age, my brother and I were integrated in a lot of the very large and very significant family decisions. And that's just what we grew up with. Our voice was always heard. And it was, it became a responsibility from a very early age, not necessarily to have an opinion about everything because that's show business at the dinner table but to be able to really reflect on it and at the dinner table share how we thought about it and what it meant for us and what we felt it would mean for us as a family. And that those rituals very much govern how we work together in the office and how we talk together at the family dinner table today. Such a... Uh an incredible experience to have when your entire life with this family dinner table. I'm, you know, I'm only curious if you felt heard when you were served a meal you didn't like, like you wouldn't eat your vegetables. And then was your opinion reflected on in the same way? Um, but uh, but it's, it's an incredible thing to, to have, you know, governance in the end in a family is are people able to come together and how much structure is needed to keep them together? And without understanding the way that empathy and, and collaboration come into that and where hierarchy has to come in for the moment, but where opinions are valued, I think that's where the key differences in many families fall. Uh, because if you're going to set out on an independent path as a next-gen family member, then it might feel like a betrayal of those values. But in many cases, it's just a long path to come back the right way to add more diversity of perspective. So we only have a few minutes left. Uh, we're going to uh, skip the last question I prepared for our panel. And for those of you listening, I'll just say it wasn't that great a question anyway. And we'd rather hear from you. Um, <laughs> now there are nine of you participating in this with us. Um, Run the world doesn't let you when you use this on Chrome on a computer. See who any of you are. So you could just be our spouses and best friends um, and people that have already heard us talk about what we do. But if you'd like to either grab the mic or put a question into the chat, I'm happy to field it for the minutes we have left. And if not, um, as, as people think about what they'd like to ask, um, I'll, I'll ask this of, of all of you. Um, Peter last, if there was one thing you'd do that had nothing related to legacy or wealth or responsibility that would make you happy and make others happy in the world of impact, in the world of helping people, what would that be and whose shoes would you walk in? The ultimate gift I'd want them to have is belief in themselves and for whatever conditioning that may have brought them to have some sort of uh, negative uh, attraction in their life or uh, self-doubt or pain, uh, I would want them to know the tools to, to, to look at removing that and then focus on and even ask other people, what do you think is my true calling? 
some people haven't had the access to the opportunity to 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 to, to reach out when you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They've never been a, allowed to pursue the self actualization. It's all about uh, food, shelter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I'd say the biggest component is for people to find that uh, superpower within themselves, what their true calling is, and then pursue it with everything you have. And, and Peter, it's a great point. The one thing unwritten much or unpublished about Maslow's hierarchy is that self-transcendence is actually the greatest form. And that's the mm -hmm. idea of being able to see beyond and above yourself. That starts with an inner belief and then it translates out into the need to believe in others and help them believe in themselves. Yes. And even for next gens that, that may have had a, you know, a, a life of financial privilege and, and, and a start that others uh, they the haven't been as socioeconomically fortunate. They still often can have many of the same issues uh, in that regard, regardless of the socioeconomic or financial standing they have. So uh, it, it, children of billionaires often have many, many big problems and issues uh, that bother them to the same degree, sometimes even worse, because there's something to live up to. What is my legacy? What could I do that, uh, that, that could remotely have any importance on the world uh, that mom or dad have already done before me? Very so, true. Okay. Matt, uh, in terms of, of your perspective on this quickly, so we don't run out of time, knowing that self-belief can't be your answer, uh, what would you see? What would you do in terms of being able to walk in somebody else's shoes and have a great impact if you weren't in the position you're in now? So, um, as I said earlier, there's a lot of commonality amongst us five here. And um, uh, what Peter was saying really resonated in terms of the work that uh, we do personally in the inner city of Los Angeles. Um, one, of the, one of the groups that I chair uh, is, a, is a gang intervention group. And basically what it is, is we take ex-gang members who have mentally decided to rehabilitate themselves, and then we help them through um, dollars and through healthcare and through opportunity go out into their very communities that they terrorized for years and um, try to affect change, right? Peaceful change, educational change, sports, after school programs, so on and so forth. And one of the, um, one of the areas that was so uh, riveting to me is that I realized if any one of these men or women that were, when I say terrorizing, these were pretty bad people. If they grew up in my house, they would be sitting right here on this panel right now. And if I grew up in their house, I'd be in that street doing the same thing. And right. what was so mm -hmm. obvious to me was just the the lack of opportunity. And that's something that society has cast upon these people. And when I when people talk about equalization, it goes far beyond economic. Now Some I, people just want the opportunity to walk to school and get an education so they can become their own, you know, uh, a path instead of having someone just throw money. And so for me, I would like to walk in those shoes for a lifetime and have them walk in mine. I would gladly give up mine. Amazing. Um, Lynn, how about you? David, it's a bit of a tricky question. I think I'm at a point in my life with everything happening in, in Beirut and, and in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia, and I'm based between all three countries. I feel I just want to do more of what I do, but with a lot, a lot more ferocity. I want to be ferocious. And I hope that in a post-COVID environment, um, I will be able to do more of that. You can all hold me accountable to it, hopefully, at the next Extraordinary Meeting. If you would take this as a compliment, I've always found you ferocious in the way you approach them. So maybe you just need a little bit of that self-actualization and Peter's self-belief. Uh, so uh, so yeah, as we close out, um, any thoughts from your perspective uh, in terms of what you do? Sophia? I think we lost you there for a second, Sophia. I, um, my mom, my, as Sophia, very sophisticated name, my mom named me after the daughter of a baker growing up. Yeah, can you hear me now? Uh, we, we only could hear some of this, so we, I will get your perspective and share it with the world another time as we end in four seconds. Thank you, Frank, for this Oasis conference, and thank you all for joining us with this. 
Thank you, Sophia, Lynn, Matt, and Peter for being part of this. I wish you all a great rest of your day or beginning of your day, depending on your time zones, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Most honored. Thank you. Great job, David. Thank you all.